great to be with you. Always nice to be with Bobby and Wanda. Uh, I see them more than here. I see them every year, uh, pretty much up at the Dove Conference. And um, it's a joy for Marin and I both to be able to be spiritual advisors to the Dove Family International, along with one other, three of us all together. And um, so we meet with the Dove Apostolic Team once a year, then the conference once a year. And then Marin and I meet with Larry and Laverne uh, different times, and then I meet with Ron from time to time. Ron's a good friend because he's got a relative that lives in North, Ca uh, a child that lives in North Carolina. So he travels down from Pennsylvania to North Carolina, and he usually tries to beat the traffic in D.C. from Baltimore coming down. So he'll give me a call and say, "Hey, you in town?" And if I am, we always meet somewhere about half past six to half past seven as he gets to Richmond on his way down for breakfast. And uh, it's just him. We meet at a certain diner. If his Bonnie's with him, and then Mara and I meet with him, and we go somewhere a little bit better than the diner that, <laughs> that just Ron and I go to. Uh, it's fine, but uh, you've got to treat the wife a little better, huh? <laughs> Amen. Especially when you marry up like we did. Hallelujah. It's a real joy to be with you, and uh, thanks for having us in the house. Got asked to speak about First Roots tonight and tomorrow night. Whether we do or not, we'll see how we go, and something different tomorrow morning. Second Roots tomorrow morning. But, uh, <laughs> but um, this subject is a very special subject to me because it is in our ministry of Church of the Nations that I apostolically lead around the world. This is probably... I would say the most freeing, liberating revelation that God's brought into us in the last 20 years. Uh, it's always hard to say one thing, you know what I mean? Because there's so much that God shares. But if I look at something that we knew before, but we're not really practicing, and then God arrested us only about 12, 13 years ago, I guess, even if that really, to the next level, to really begin to live by it, or many of us, um, then it shifted us. Apostolic words should shift us. It's one of the things about the apostolic, it should shift us. I was in a denominational church last Sunday up in another state, I won't say where or what, but a fairly well-known denominational church. I was with an apostolic team there speaking on fathers and sons, and this man had come up from this denominational church, but he had asked on the Sunday morning, would it be for Mara and I to go down there. And we went, it was interesting really, it's quite a, it's in a, as I said, a different state, quite a ways from here. And um, after I ministered on the Sunday morning, uh, he stood up, the pastor of this church, and he's very impacted, but he's been impacted for the, we'd been together for six hours over the couple of mornings before on this other subject. And, um, but he just stood and said an interesting thing to me, uh, not to me, but to the congregation. The congregation have been very kind and given us a kind of a standing ovation and things. So obviously it was very simple stuff we were sharing, stuff you'd know, very, you'd know better than me probably. But we're just sharing just some kingdom things. And then he stood up and he said in the year, he got, had been saved in this church, then been a traveling ministry for some years and then come back to take it over some years back. So he'd been there in and around it for a long time. And he just said this interesting thing. He just said, um, I have many brothers come here to minister and wonderful gift ministries and people that, that just uh, love God and love us and it's been tremendous. And he filled up with tears and he said, but this is the first time ever in this church we've had an apostolic father stood here today and shifted us. And I thought after, you know, I thought, Lord, it was such a simple word, really, for me. It's a basic word, really, just on what it is to be sons of the kingdom and sown as sons and that kind of thing. And, um, but it, it's true, apostolic life should shift us. And I'm not here to shift you. You're apostolically aligned very well. You know what I mean? You, uh, you are apostolically aligned. But when you go into something like that, that's not really, there's something that different gifts do, and one thing the apostolic does, it shifts. 
And when this word came into our life, it was like an apostolic word that came into us and it shifted us. It shifted me. It didn't come through an apostolic ministry coming sharing it. It came in a different kind of way. But it came into me as the apostolic father of, what I, of that which I lead. And then when I brought it into the whole, it shifted us. I brought it to the apostolic council. We got a couple of theologians on there. Uh, one from a Presbyterian background, one from a Baptist background uh, that are now kingdom-minded believers uh, like myself, but uh, one a little older than me, one quite a bit younger. But as we sat around, we said, okay, we want to spend the next weeks or months really just, is this accurate? Is it true? Is it, is it what we're really looking for? Is it really what the Word teaches? And they came back after going through the Scripture saying, yeah, this is it then a man i was just with a couple of weeks ago in germany in the, what used to be the eastern german block i was just in there um having a weekend's ministry with them but he had me in to teach on first fruits some years back as well and he said an interesting thing that he took it to a jewish rabbi he's a friend with a jewish rabbi in the city or a couple of them and he just gave them the notes and, and the message that I shared when I was there with them. It's going to do it a bit different tonight because you've had quite a bit of teaching on it already. And the rabbis went through and said, where did this guy get the teaching? He said, why? He said, this is the most accurate understanding of God's economy that we've heard even as Jews. And so it is interesting just when you hear around this, not because I'm sharing it, but other words you've had here, Bobby teaching on it, you know, and you get it into your heart because it, it is a very apostolic shifting word if you get holding. It could answer a lot of the questions that you need answered in your individual lives. That's how real it is to me. Now, I'm not trying to sell it or anything. I'm just simply saying <laughs> what happened. I was, uh, when it began to happen to me, I was just in a little room in Richmond with a few people. Uh, just in a house and I'd come across a, a little bit of a, a broken half a message on an old tape that I listened to and um, when I listened to this message on this tape it just stirred something up in me afresh in the economic ways I've been teaching on economic things for years uh, God's interest in your financial interests and the series we do now called Money Matters and um, those things but when I heard this little this message something started to shift in me and I said God I want to meet this person and I eventually did he lived in another country but on my way on that journey it's when I then began to take it that next step to really understanding um, let me say this that that message I heard that night was the message on the separation of tithes and offerings now, I believe that years before, when we used to plant churches, we always never ever received tithes and offerings together because tithes and offerings in the American church and the Western church have simply become synonymous with taking a collection. Okay, we're going to receive tithes and offerings this morning. We don't mean we're receiving tithes and offerings. We're just taking a collection, really. It's just another way of saying it. So when we first started planting, even here in America all those years back, we always separated tithes and offerings. We'd always receive an offering in a meeting and we'd have boxes out the front where people bought their tithes called the storehouse. And we never ever used tithe money for anything other than people. And I won't go into teach on that, but that was a part of the message that I was hearing that day. Then I got hungry for something else because I began to think there's still something missing. Because I had taught on tithing for years. And my problem was I saw too many people who were tithing that were not living blessed. That was the reality. I've seen some churches so abused teaching on giving that they had really collected people into debt. Even bankruptcy. I could tell you stories. I've had to walk through in the world rescuing churches that have been so manipulated and controlled for finances that people had literally gone into serious debt, believing that if all, another offering, if they just put in, therefore, you know, instant tomorrow, all of that. 
And so I had enough reasons to have all kinds of questions, but I had a bigger thing was there's still a missing key. And that's when I was out in, a, in, a, in Australia and um, I went into a church to minister and the guy said, oh, you heard of so-and-so? I said, yeah, I knew the guy's church. He said, they've really got into some crazy teaching up there. It was in another state in Australia, a couple of thousand miles from where I was. And I said, oh, really, what's that? Yeah, they're telling their people that they've got to give 40% of their income. And I said, oh, really, that sounds a bit odd. I know these guys. I don't think that's true. But maybe you're right. But I knew in my heart I had to go there and find out. And I went there, and I knew these people. And I walked, got off the plane, went straight to the office, and I went in. The pastor's daughter was running the office, and I knew her for all kinds of reasons over some years. And she saw me and said, oh, great to see you again and that. And I said, hey, I hear you guys have gotten some weird teaching up here about giving 40% of your income. She said, no, but I think I know what you mean. You must be meaning about this teaching we've embraced for first fruits. And I said, yeah, it could be. And so I said, have you got the CDs? And uh, it gave me a couple of CDs. And before I left there, to get to where I was staying, a few miles down the road, I just pulled over the car, devoured these two D DVDs, and it was the missing link. And I knew it. I sat in the car, just so changed. I was being shifted. I was being just changed. I said, God, all my life, this is the missing link in your economy. And so that's how real it became to me. And it was out of that foundation I, we began to study it, then gave it to the team, gave it to the theologians, eventually to the rabbis and everywhere else. <laughs> that was later. That was nothing to do with me. But um, eventually just confirming in heart the reality of this. So I just want to give you a little bit of the basis on it from our perspective. You've had other you know, teachings on it. Bobby teaches on it. And then if you want any questions and answers and just talking about it tonight and tomorrow night if we need to continue on the practical side of it, of how do we practice it now and how do we live it? Because I, you know, I, I just want to help you and serve you while I'm here if we can. Now understand most of what this book is about is nothing to do with heaven. It's all to do with heaven on earth. Amen. See, most of this book, people say, if I don't tithe, will I go to heaven? Can I go to heaven? It's got nothing to do with heaven. Heaven's got something to do with grace, a sacrifice on the cross, and a Father that loves you. It's nothing to do with whether you put enough money in the bowl or not. Most of this book is about how do you live free here on earth? And what are the kingdom principles you live in to live free on earth? Because one day, the economies of this world are going to become the kingdoms and economies of our God. One day... The nations will operate um, on basically somewhere between a 14 to 15 percent tax bracket. Why? Because that's the kingdom economy. That's why one of the most prosperous nations still in the world today, Switzerland, operates on about 14 percent to 14 and a half percent tax. 12 percent federal tax, one and a half canton tax, and a little bit of other. That's why very wealthy people cannot afford to move out of Switzerland because of the tax bracket like Roger Federer, if you follow tennis or anyone else, you know, uh, you think, why do they live in such a place like that? Because of taxes above everything else. Why? Because if you take first fruits, the tithe, and what God asks us to give to the poor, it works out about 14% of income. Now, it's interesting, at the last presidential election here, um, whatever one thinks of that or not thinks of it, or tries not to think of it, whatever, whichever way you've come from or how you've traveled, the, the bottom line is simply this. One or two of the candidates, one was running uh, pretty well just on the tithe. Uh, Carson, he, he, he wanted to run with a, a tax system that would just be a 10%. One other was running on a flat tax situation at about 14 to 15%. Why? Because even in the world today, many nations in the world, they're, going to, they're looking to us to find the answers. The kingdom of heaven is going to have the answers for everything that nations need. And so n nations will operate. I won't go and get sidetracked on that tonight, but they're coming to us. The Bible says the kings and rulers are coming to the brightness of our rising, the rising on us. 
to find out how to do it. Now, here's the difficulty. If they came to most of the church in Western culture today, they wouldn't learn a thing because they only bump into a charismatic form of the, of the problem, not the answer. <laughs> Amen or oh me. I'm talking to the choir tonight, I realize, but you know, that's what we've got to reason through and wrestling through. Why? See, we living in a day-to-day -day where it's not going to be enough just to give people a scripture. This generation, or not the millennials, but the Y generation, now the Z or Z generation, it's not going to be enough just to give them a scripture. I won't go on today because we've got some young people in the room and that, but, and I'm not here to, to raise family tonight, not that they'll mind, but it's not enough to be able to say to teenagers today somewhere in the world, flee fornication. Or it's not right to have sex before marriage. You're going to have to explain why. It's no good just giving the scripture. But why? What was God's reasoning behind it? You've got to go into covenant. What covenant is all about? How covenant was made? Because they'll ask you the very basic questions. The same with whatever areas you're talking about in life. There's more to it than just all the answers are in here. Don't get me wrong. But it's not just enough to say, like one guy said years ago to us when he was young, someone told him to flee fornication, and he went out of that meeting thinking, I've got no idea who he is, but if I ever meet him in a dark alley on a Saturday night, I'm going to run like crazy. <laughs> because I, he couldn't even spell it, let alone know what it meant. So it's not going to be sufficient in the day we live in just to quote a few texts. It's much easier when Wesley was here or Booth was here or Finney was here or somebody because at least the people that would quote the scripture believed in the Bible. Now we've got a generation out there that doesn't even believe this. Well, the Bible says so what? The Quran says this. Or some philosopher says this. What does it matter what the Bible says? Where in Wesley's day, you only have to stand up and say the Bible says, and people say, well, that's what it really says, then I want to adjust my life to that. Because there was a basic cultural belief, in the Bible at least, that's why I love talking about the glorious church as well because that's the only thing we've got today to hang our hat on is relationship and a church body that lives as one body. That's all we've got left because that's the only thing that can provoke the world to jealousy because in the end, that's the way God said it, the only reason they'll know we're Christians are by our love, not by our sermons, not even by our meetings, not even by our music, by our love. It's incredible, really. And that's for one another, isn't it? We were chatting a little bit about this earlier. So this whole thing of first fruits and that, what's it about? It's about getting your life into order with the ways of God so you can live in all the blessings of God. Now, people say, well, isn't that law? People say that about tithing, won't they? Well, isn't it law? Surely we're in the new covenant now, you know? Isn't that law? No, it's not law because one, number one, tithing, first fruits particularly, was given a long way before tithing in the Bible, but even tithing was given 600 years before the law. See, the tithing wasn't included in the law because of legal reasons, but because of grace reasons. Because God so loved his people that when they were even wandering away from him, he put the very thing in the law that could release the blessings of heaven into their life as an act of love to them, that even when they're in disobedience, they could still live blessed. So the financial teaching in the law was an act of his grace, not his legalness. Amen? Well, that's it for tonight? No. <laughs> you got to... It's those principles. I've been teaching around our ministry quite a bit lately that nearly everything Marilyn and I have ever come into in our life, we came in through the miraculous to learn how to live in the principle so we could bring others into the miracle. But God doesn't run his universe by miracles. He runs it by principles. But he introduces us to them by miracles. So I got introduced in my personal life many years before this when I look back into first fruit harvest before I even knew it was first fruits through the miracle that then we learned how to live in the principle but 
methodology is not law or legalism. I'll give you a great illustration here that I only felt in my own heart recently as a, a best way to describe it. What's the great, one of the greatest gifts of grace that we have on the human race today? Is air, isn't it? Breathing. Because we can't live without it. An act of grace. Now, as f that's free. Totally free. Amen? It's total grace. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. Nothing. It's total grace. But God has given you an apparatus. It's called lungs and the mouth and that kind of thing. But if you don't put that apparatus into practice, the great grace gift of air cannot help you one bit at all. If you don't breathe it in, you keep your mouth shut, you don't let your lungs work, nothing happens, you'll die. Why? It's grace. Why should you have to work to get it when it's free? Well, you don't work. It's just simply an apparatus God has given to release his grace. So a financial economic foundation is no different. It's not under law. It's just simply an act, a, a, a mathematical foundation that enables that grace to flow. It's got to flow through something. Everything God does flows through something. And so when you think about these things, it's how to live your life on earth. How many of you want to win here? See, heaven can take care of itself. You know what I mean? Whatever one might believe how all that unfolds. That can take care of itself. The issue is not there, it's here. Jesus didn't come to get you saved to take you to heaven to meet the Father. He brought the Father here to you. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Dad. That's why he never said, when he said, well, he said it this way, when, when he, they said, teach us how to pray, he said, pray this way. Pray thy kingdom come. He didn't say, pray thy church go. He said, pray thy kingdom come. Let your will, Father, be done right here as it was originally intended to be on earth as it is in heaven. So his aim was to bring heaven this way. In our Western church, we've now spent all of our effort trying to get the church from here to there where God was getting the Father, uh, Jesus was bringing the Father from there to here. So it was always heaven coming this way. So this book largely is a lot to do with how you live here. And if we can live by those principles here in his grace and let that vent <laughs> in us then we can live in all the fullness of what it's about I don't have any question or doubt in my heart at all that God wants us to live debt free life and I teach the difference there between investment and just debt uh, borrowing for investment and increase than just debt but I haven't got time to go into that tonight because I'm not doing the seminar but um, you know dealing with that you also got to understand the difference between devotional money and transactional money. Because we, we're talking mostly about de devotional money here tonight, tithes, first fruits, offerings, that kind of thing. Transactional money that we buy and sell with and operate in the marketplace. There are some different principles. One's got to operate in some of that just to make business work and to see business go forward. So we're talking more of the devotional money side of things tonight. Our personal response to God and our giving in to God that releases us into that place that we can then operate with great reward in our transactional money life. Amen? So it's what we do in our devotional life, devotional money life, that ends up marking us for success or failure in our transactional life, particularly those of you that are running your own companies or businesses or wanting to get more out in that kind of way. And so, let's keep an eye on the clock. Got to be out of here by 10, I heard. Um, only a few minutes yet. So, when you start to look at this whole subject of first fruits, just want to say this much again. Um, I had the, the joy just three weeks ago being in Wittenberg for, you know, it's a 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And I was standing at the, the gate there where Martin Luther nailed the theses, these 95 theses onto the door and as I was just standing there and thinking this 500 years that have happened and all that you've restored God into the body of Christ over that time, it all started with one revelation really, the just shall live by faith but that 500 years ago when it happened prior to that the 
the, the years prior to that, from 300 to um, right through to 1500, that 1200 year period that took us down from the way the early church was born and released and lived when the Constantine era took it, started to take it into religion and darkness, I won't go into all of that, but then went down right through the dark ages to get down to that moment of, of Luther's um, revelation that started the restoration process, uh, the reformation and the restoration process that we're almost at completion of now, if you really study it through history, which is a very exciting day in which we're living in. But a part of that which uh, what got taken out by Constantine was first fruits. It was one of the first things that went. That's why it's one of the last things to get restored. Right? It was not necessarily in that order, but it was one of the things that was taken out. He brought giving down to only twofold, just to tithes and offerings. Up to then, the early church lived totally with a threefold giving because everything that truly represented God was threefold. Anything else, you see, you, you can argue anything from that one mathematical principle. I come from a math background, so that's why I might talk math a little bit, because I got baptized in the Spirit through math, not through theology. I just saw one day me and the Holy Spirit equals power, me equals no power. I knew what was missing. It was a simple, it was a simple equation for me. It, it didn't take four years in Bible school to learn that one. It was just simple math. You know, I understand what's wrong with the church and the kingdom on earth today. It's because there's only four basic principles to math. God wanted us to live in two. Instead, we live in the other two. God's only thing he ever told us to live in was addition and multiplication, and we live in subtraction and division. Math's wonderful, isn't it? Don't you think? To love math is to love life. That's what I told my daughters, but they didn't all believe me. One did, almost. And so, what I'm saying is, everything of three represent what God's about. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's God, isn't it? Family, husband, wife, kids. Everything's threefold. These three shall remain faith, hope, and love. You can build all everything out of those things. Everything through Scripture builds on three. And giving to represent God was always first fruits, tithes, and offerings. It was never just tithes and offerings. So he took the first fruit out. Why? Because as soon as you take first fruit giving out, you take giving back into control. People don't have freedom so much over their giving because church today basically says bring your tithe to the church, bring offerings in, we tell you when to bring them, you know basically. But first fruits releases us again into absolute freedom of giving in our own hearts, spontaneous light that brings multiplication, which I'll explain as we go. And so, first fruits was the very first place of giving was introduced in the Bible. Now, it wasn't the tithe. We would think it's the tithe when it gets taught today, but as first fruits was where it all started. And it started right back as early as Genesis chapter 4. And that's where we just need to start tonight to understand the principle a little bit. It said, And Adam knew Eve as his wife, and she became pregnant and bore Cain, and she said, I have gotten and gained a man with the help of the Lord. And next she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now in the course of time, Cain brought the Lord an offering. Listen to this. He brought the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Generous. And Abel brought the firstborn, or the first fruit, right? Just think about this, of his flock, and of the fat portions of that first lamb that was born. And the Lord had respect and regard for Abel and for his offering, says in Hebrews 11.4. But for Cain and his offering, he had no respect, no regard, so Cain was exceedingly angry and indignant, and he looked sad and depressed. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why do you look sad and depressed and dejected? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not so well, sin crouches at the door. Now, here's something I want to say about Father's love for you. 
God never said to Cain, and when you go later on in the last book in Malachi of the Bible, when it talks about tithes and giving then offerings, meaning first fruits offering in there as well, when it talks about that there, God never says if you don't do it, he's going to send you the devourer or he's going to send you this one at the door. He said they're already there, right? They came there a few weeks before when Adam and Eve got a bit messed up in apple picking that day. But it all, they were already there. So he's not saying, if you do not do these things, I'm going to punish you by sending you the devourer or sending you someone to rip you off. Not at all. He said, that's already there. I just want you to live in the principles, Father said, so you can get free from that and get that taken care of. And he said, here is the key issue was going to be the first fruit situation. Now, why first fruits? Well, I guess that's God's business. But it was going to go all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It was going to be the way he was going to build after the fall of man. I think once we get the full restored earth and all the nations are the kingdoms of our, uh, of our God again and Father's back here with us on earth and we've got the new heaven and the new earth all here together, whatever you believe in all that, but I haven't got time to talk about that. But when all that's happening and we're all here and excited about it and we're all in it, then probably this will be irrelevant again as it would have been right there in the garden. But after, something had to begin to take place. And what was it to do with? It was going to be the foundation of everything. It was the first fruit. If man was ever going to be redeemed, if the world was ever going to be restored, would have to be the fathers. And it was going to be put in from day one all the way through. That's why we, you and I are here tonight. Why? Because Father gave his first fruit offering. His only begotten son. That the firstborn might become the first of many. Because the only sacrifice that can release that kind of redemption is a first fruit sacrifice. Now, there are all kinds of reasons. If you lived in Europe or something like that, you would understand that many families, up to recent years really, their firstborn would have been set aside for Christian ministry automatically because the first fruit had to go straight to God. They were set aside, raised from. That's why a nation like this, when you think like Harvard University and Yale and all these kinds of things, built on such incredible kingdom principles, a lot of it was first fruit life. But you imagine like when John Adams, not the one that just lost the election here, but the other John Adams, um, when John Adams um, went through... Harvard, he was only something like 14 or 15 years old. And he graduated, I think, by the time he was 16. In their first semester or two semesters at Harvard in that time, you know what you had to do as a student, 13, 14 years old? Translate from the Greek the whole New Testament. That was your first route. That's where the education started, right there. So it went all the way through history, through life, through nations, through everything else. It's only us that we've come into the difficulty with it. So the first fruit started right back there in Genesis in that um, principle and that um, basis there that Adam's offering was acceptable because it was a first fruit offering. Cain's wasn't because it was just out of the abundance of the harvest. Now, what's the difference? Here is the simple difference. For Abel, there was no guarantee that there would be another lamb. I mean, a blight could have gone through the rest of the crop. There could have been a huge storm that killed everything or whatever. There was no guarantee. But that first lamb was harvested butchered in the right way and the very best meat of it was brought it said no guarantee from there on except except of God's view of a first fruit offering that if the first fruit was blessed the whole lump would be blessed that's the principle of first fruit giving and that's what we're going to 
look at through. It's only the introduction now, but that's, that's the message. See, an offering out of your abundance, praise God for it, God's grace, and he loves us to give out of our abundance as well. wasn't a judge not to do that. But that's got to follow the first fruit offering. Because the first fruit offering is where you're totally abandonedly saying to God, God, the very first in my life is yours. And if there's no guarantees after this moment, accept the fact that you honor your word. It's a huge step of faith in that sense. However, one exercises first fruits, and that's a story a bit later, but how one practices it. But it's the principle of it I want to get in your heart tonight because we cannot have a kingdom people on earth, I believe in my heart, that's not a first fruiting people. I will bring offerings, we'll bring blessings, we'll even call it tithes and offerings. But you realize even on a biblical tithe, even what the Bible teaches a tithe actually is, it's only something like 4 to 5% of American Christians that actually do tithe. It's amazing, really. No wonder we've got as much problem in the church as we have out of it. And even those who may step out into that often can't come into the fullness of it because the first fruit is not blessed. 1 Kings 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. This is verse 8. And dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now think of this story. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. This is Elijah. And when he came to the gate of the city, and indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please give me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said, oh, do not fear. Now, when you think about this, now Elijah's been at the brook Cherith for some time. The brook eventually dried up. He knew the supernatural power of God, said their ravens came every day to feed him by the brook brought him both bread and meat, which is a miracle in itself. Number one is ravens don't eat bread. And secondly, they're scavenger birds. So they eat off the dead animals. There was a drought, so there'd be dead animals up the river, right? But God wouldn't bring that kind of meat to his prophet or to you. If you believe that, you're going to always live with second or third or fourth best. So the interesting thing, where was the ravens getting the meat and bread from? And one, they don't eat bread, so they're not really, it's not on their diet. And the meat that they could get to live themselves just off old carcasses is dying in a drought upriver, except for one place, because the only place that would have that kind of good food would be in the king's palace. And who was in the king's palace? Jezebel. Isn't it incredible that the greatest time of need is to a prophetic apostolic people that God can move the wealth from the heathen to his people? It's good to think about these stories in the Bible. They unfold it. They're not just a story. There's something more in them, you see. And in the, in the travel and the journey, so now he's moved on from the brook Cherith. Here's a good thing to understand always as a Christian. He never moved because the brook dried up. He only moved on the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, now go to Zarephath. I've got a, a, um, I've got a woman there, that widow, and I've prepared her. She's ready to feed you. Now, when he got there, I mean, he must have been totally, almost confused because there was a number of widows there how do we know there was a number? Because in the New Testament, when it talks back about that, he says, it says there were many widows that day in the land of Israel, but God only took Elijah to one. 
Now, here's a very interesting thing. In Kings, you would think that God was taking Elijah to the widow for him. But the New Testament records that, no, he took him for her. And him, but for her. All the widows, there's only one that he took him there for. Now, when he got there, you can imagine, it wasn't like she was really expecting him. And yet God has said to him, I've prepared her for you. Well, either she didn't get the message or Elijah was a bit confused or something, but he was probably walking around thinking, I wonder if that's her. She's probably thinking, who's that? And then eventually, here she is in this desperate situation, he yells out, can you give me a little water? And by the way, could you get me a cake? She said, I've just got a little oil, a little water, a little bit of flour. We're going to make our last cake and my son and I, we're going to die. Here he is, led by God to the first church of the negative. <laughs> I mean, you imagine, desperate. And then he says to her, I'll paraphrase this tonight, or I can read it, but he says to her then, as the Lord God lives, she said, I don't, and Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do what you have said, but make me a small cake from it and bring it to me and then afterwards make one for you and your son. Now either Elijah was the biggest jerk that ever lived, right? And certainly another guy you'd want to come and minister in your local church. Or he knew something. And she was partly right. It wasn't long after her son did die. But something was happening in the first fruit realm that was going to raise him from the dead. First fruits have great consequences. Right? Here he is saying to a dying widow, if you want to get through this, you're going to have to bring your first fruit cake to me. Now, it wasn't such a big step of faith for her because she was feeling she was going to die anyhow, I guess. She probably thought, well, I'll give him the cake. I'll just die a day quicker. But the principle that Elijah was moving in was if she's going to come into the fullness of her freedom, there's a principle she needs to live in. Because the answer in God is never in what you have in God. It's always in what you've got. See, when Elisha's, you know, that widow came to Elisha, it's an incredible story. Elisha did many of the same miracles that Elijah did, only twice as many because he, he got twice the anointing, the double portion. If you count them up in the Bible, he did exactly two times more than Elijah, Elijah did because he asked for twice the anointing. Anyhow, he had a similar one with the widow. The widow comes, and what does the widow say? Yeah. Terrible, scary story, really. Your servant, he, he says to Elisha, your, she says, your servant, my husband, is dead. And he's left me with all this debt. He gave his life to work for you, Elisha. He's working for the prophet. And his economics were such a mess that he died prematurely and left me in a mess. That's why the way we treat our leaders and build and educate them economically is very important. And she said, not only that, my sons were security against the debt. I was driving down through the bottom half of Virginia one time and saw the sign on the thing, stop, screamed to stop in my car because there in the field was a debtor's prison. The only one I've ever seen in the world, right here in Virginia. Sitting there in the field, little sign, debtor's prison. It's a little room where you had to put because you couldn't pay your debt. And I walked across there in that little room and stood there. And I said, dear God, couldn't pay the debt, so that had to be locked up in there till the money could get released from somewhere. But he said, they were going to put my sons into debtor's prison. This came alive to me in Virginia. But in debtor's prison... I lost my husband, I'm going to lose my sons. All because he gave up his life to serve you, Elisha. And Elisha looks at her and he, it's incredible. He doesn't even feel sorry for her, it seems. All he says to her is, what have you got? 
because all you've told me up till now is what you haven't got. And what you haven't got can't help me, can't help you, can't help your sons. What have you got? And she said, all I've got is a little jar of oil. It's all I've got left. Move that. It's my first fruit. of. It's all I've got. It's my first and last and middle fruit. He says, go borrow all the jars from your neighbors and start to pour. First fruit giving is very costly because you can have a lot you've got to put that money into. But when you start to pour it, it's all you got, maybe. Certainly the first fruit of all you got. No guarantee, another lamb. Anything could happen tomorrow. It's not here, I've got a good bank account now and here's a bit of surplus, I'm going to give it to God's work. This was a key bit. And you know what happened? She borrowed it. You imagine the embarrassment, everything. She had to knock on the door. Hello. Hello, widow. Hello, sad widow. How are you? What are you doing? I would like to borrow some jars if I could. But you're poor. Why would you want jars? These are big jars. These aren't little jars. These are big jars like this. Well, I'm expecting an oil delivery. But we've seen you in the village. You're so downtrodden. You've got nothing left. You're losing your sons, everything. You're so hopeless. You're dejected. And never could I borrow some jars. Went to all the neighbors, got all these jars in the house. And Elisha said, Poor. Could you imagine what it must have been like? Talk about a bit of bread and a few fish feeding 5,000. First fruit meal, fed the whole multitude. Always does. It always starts with the first fruit, she said. Began to drop it. Plonk, plonk, on the bottom of this big jar. And it never stopped. Started to fill. Started to fill. All the jars were filled. And it never ran out till the last one was filled. Could you imagine what it must have been like? The Bible said there was enough feed her, what she could sell, pay the debt, got the sons out of the prison, fed them, everyone else. You know, if she had just borrowed a few more jars, she could have fed the whole village and maybe the next village because it never ran out. She was the only one who put the restriction on where it would run out. So the first root principle all the way through. Jesus, they're hungry. They've been sitting here for years, for days. They're hungry. What do we got? All we got is one little boy's lunch. Now, they had the money to go to the villages and buy it because they even said to Jesus, do you want us to go to the villages and buy enough food for 5,000? Could you imagine the Christian church today so blessed and so moving 5,000 people turn up to a conference and the leadership just wants to buy them all lunch and there's no registration fee so they said we'll go and buy it but it'll take us a while we're going to have to go to a few villages there's a lot of people and Jesus said no this time let's just do it supernatural what do we got all we got whether you call it sowing or reaping, the principles or whatever it is, it all starts with the first fruit principle. So that's the main thing I want to get into your heart tonight. Because otherwise the practice, you, you never want first fruits to come down just a methodology, just something we do or whatever it is. There's got to be something in your heart that so grips your heart that says, God, I don't want to journey in life without you being honored with the very first of everything I am. That's where it starts and ends for me. When that gets you. So what's the principle? Here's the principle. You give the first fruits to the man of God, man or woman of God, or wherever it is, and we'll enlarge on that as we go, and the rest doesn't run out. You just give it when you've got a little bit of extra. The devil's waiting at the door to get the rest. 
And I'm not trying to put fear in you or anything. I'm just teaching the principles because God's grace overrules all kinds of things in our life and all that. I understand. But I understand something gets incredibly released. We've seen farms where the first cow was given to be the only farm in Africa left for the full herd and multiple calves and milk and everything else because of the first fruit giving. People who never really understood it or knew it began to sit on the teaching and say, yeah, I remember when God first told us to do that and we're the only farm in the whole area. Story after story that can happen in the practical sense of it. I could tell you kingdom stories, you know, tonight and tomorrow and that around these kinds of areas. But the principle that I just want to get into your heart is that. And then it says in Matthew 6, 19, Do not lay up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy or where you do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you, darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now when Jesus was teaching this principle, he was teaching first fruits. Why? The greatest teacher of first fruits that we know of was a man called Hillel. And Hillel was a, a Jewish rabbi teaching young rabbinical students. And many believe that he would have been one of Jesus' tutors in his being raised up. He was such a, a well-respected rabbinical leader that many people thought he was the Messiah. He was so powerful. Now, his main message that he taught was the first fruit message. And he taught it this way. He said, when you bring a first fruit, he said, um, and this is where they got confused in that other church with the 40%. He said, a first fruit is either, you're either going to bring a 40th, a 50th, or a 60th. Not 40%, 50% or 60%, 2.5%, 2 and 3 quarter percent, you know, 40th or 50th, or 60th percentage. 2.5% uh, or 2 and a quarter percent are down to 2%. And he said this in his teaching, he used to say this, if you bring your 2.5%, that's what they worked it out later, which I can explain to you. But if you bring your 2.5% as a fr uh, first fruit, he said, your eye is full of light, and therefore your whole life will be full of light. So if you only bring um, a 50th, you've got a middling eye. Right? And he said, if you bring a 60th, you're an infidel. Which was interesting. Now understand, Jesus, picking up that thought, probably taught by Hillel, teaches here in this scripture that I read to you, do not, let yourself, uh, do not lay up yourself treasured on earth where moth and rust destroy, but where thieves break in and steal. But lay up yourself treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, the lamp of your body is the eye right, is the eye, if therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Now, if you only, if you, no, sorry, I, I said that slightly wrong, the 40th, the 50th, the 60th, if you only brought a 60th, it said you had, a, you, you, you were evil, you brought an evil eye. If you didn't bring first fruits at all, you're an infidel, right? Now, here, Jesus is saying, you see, bring it back to the eye, in what, Hallel used to teach, that's where we get the whole saying today, don't give me the evil eye. Have you ever heard that in America, in Australia, that we use that saying, don't give me the evil eye. That's coming straight from teaching on first fruits that Hallel used to teach. If your eye is full of, e of darkness, your whole body will be. So it's a suspicious eye, it's an evil eye, it's one that doesn't take risk or, or faith, it's just this evil eye. And he said, if you're like that, if you're so cautious like that and you're so protective and so self-centered, your whole body will be like that. So here, LL is teaching. Now, Jesus goes on and teaches that. He doesn't change subject halfway through these verses. He's talking about money from the beginning to the end. And he starts off by saying, lay up yourself tre treasures in heaven, etc. 
For where your treasure is, your heart will be. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, the whole body will be full of light. What did Hillel say? If you bring a 40th, you won't have an evil eye, you'll have a good eye, and your whole body will be full. 50th. And then he went on to say, but if your eye is bad, in other words, 60th, your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you um, is in darkness, how great is that darkness? For no one can serve two masters. What was he saying? He, they knew exactly what he was saying because it was Hillel's main teaching. And he was one of their main teachers of the day. But what he was saying is this. You see, in the end of the day, you cannot serve two masters and the only one way you can make sure of that that you're only going to serve one is the first fruits go to him. Otherwise, the very thing that you're giving out of will be your master. And today for many Christians, they spend their life with ma money mastering them. And then out of all that mess up of their life, they may bring an offering to, to God. And I'm not condemning that, please, in this new covenant which we live in. But there's a much better way that you can lay a foundation to put an economic foundation in your life that can set you free to live. And it's called this wonderful thing of first fruits. Very simple. Two and a half percent of income. That's what it, how do I, what, how, why do we say two and a half percent? Some say slightly different amounts, but simply because of this. What was first fruits? And probably when we get through this, we probably had plenty for tonight. But what was first fruits? First fruits was this that when there was a crop grown, there's always a part of the crop that came up first before the rest. Even today, if it's not manufactured farming and harvesting, exactly the same. If it's natural organic farming, exactly the same today. The first time I ever taught this message was in Durban in South Africa. And after I taught it, a woman came up to me and she said, now I've got my answer. I said, why? She said, I work for something, United Nations or something like that, but in an agricultural area, and I've just been in a big meeting in Hong Kong or in Asia somewhere, and someone came up to me in training the agricultural leaders came up to me and said, why is it that every time a crop grows, one part of it comes up first? And she said, I never knew until I sat in this meeting here on the Sunday night in Durban. Why? Because the divine principle that God put into nature. Nature knows it. So when the first crop, when they, they sowed the crop, a part of it would come up first. And that part that they came was harvested and all of it was taken to the high priest. Not a tithe of it, no, the whole of it. The whole of that, the bit that came up first. So when they moved on to be more, more than just agricultural, when they moved on to be more business oriented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and they went to the rabbinical leadership and, of their day, and they said, how do we honor the principle of first fruits when we don't have a crop? And people who've studied this much more than me, you could research it, I'm sure, and people that I had research it for us came up and said, but there was a time when a, there was a, 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 a survey or whatever you did, a look at about 100 crops, and it was estimated that the first fruit that came up was always somewhere between a 40th and a 60th of the crop. About 2.5%, down to about 2%. And when that crop came up, that part was wholly harvested and taken to the high priest. It's like the first cake going to Elijah. You want to know where apostles and prophets are going to be funded from in the full establishment of the kingdom on earth through first fruit giving? I can already give you some illustrations of that today, but out of first fruits giving, that's where they'll be funded by because that's where the high priest will say, well, Apostles and prophets aren't the high priests. Of course we're not today. Understand that fully. No one stands between you and God. But in position, not in what they could do, but in position, Jesus tied it all together, all the scripture did in Hebrews, when it said Jesus is both the high priest and apostle of our, our faith. So positioning the apostolic, and I believe the prophetic and other fivefold ministry as well, is what is in position like the high priest was in the old covenant. Not 
the stance between you and God anymore because there is only one, but in position in the government of God on the earth. And so, you know, that money that came in, that first fruit was totally taken to the high priest. And then the rest of the crop grew. And what happened when the rest of the crop grew? They tithed on it. So what were they tithing on? They were tithing on the 97.5% of the whole crop that was left. Because the first 2.5%, 100% went. But now the 97.5% of the crop that was left, say, they tithed on that. How they tithe on it? You know, they harvested, put it on the back of donkeys, one donkey, two donkey, three donkey, four, five donkey, six donkey, seven donkey, eight, or whatever. Every tenth one pulled aside, taken in to the, the, um, the Levitical, uh, into the... Um, the, the tribe there, uh, the priestly tribe, out of which they would then would tithe onto the high priest as well. So the high priest was living on the um, the first fruits of all of everything, and then the tithe of just one tribe. Then, because all the others went there, that's how the knock-on effect happened. And so, as all that was being harvested and brought in, that's the way they practiced. So when they brought it into the new age for them. They said it was that two and a half percent. That's what Hillel taught and Jesus went on. And that's why we come to the basis of believing first fruits is around that two and a half percent mark of income. And it's a beautiful place to start your financial giving. Why? Because it's not huge amounts. What is two and a half percent? It's $25 in a thousand. It's not large amounts of money. See, someone gets saved and comes into your church, and we trust more and more do. But if they do, and they come in and they go through a membership class and hear some teaching on tithing, it's going to blow their mind. Most of them, they're never going to be able to do it initially. Why? Because some of them are coming in already with negative cash flow. They've already got more going out than what's coming in the week, and now you've got to take another 10% off of them. Good night. <laughs> See, you've got to introduce them into God's economy the way that God introduced his economy through the door of first fruits. And as they go through first fruits, they'll end up going into the first tithe, then they'll go to the second tithe, then they'll go to the third tithe. That sounds a bit weird, but that's got to be explained, otherwise you throw your Bible at me. But the second tithe, the third tithe, which is where we tithe to ourselves and give to the poor and that kind of thing as well. And so all that began to generate um, the wealth that God wanted. So in God's economy, those who needed to be set apostolic prophetic leadership could be blessed. Those who needed to be set aside, like in leadership in local church and that kind of thing, they could be blessed. The person themselves could be blessed and the poor could be taken care of. That was God's economy. And it all worked out at about 14 to 15% of income. Amazing, really, that we live in a day now where nations are trying to get to that. Everyone participated, from the poorest to the wealthiest, they all participated the same on percentages. It's not like our modern tax brackets where the bottom 20, 30 percent pay nothing. The top two and a half percent pay a lot less than their share, and the middle class gets poorer. That's not just rumors or one party or another. It's just fact of what happens in culture at large. Probably 40, 50 percent of the population carry the weight for most of the people. And in some nations, South Africa, where I work, you know, when you work there and realize still today only about 12% of the nation even pay taxes. Recently, it was only 7%. So that means 7% of the people in a whole nation like South Africa is funding everybody else. So no wonder tax brackets have to be so high for so few. But see, in God's economy, because it's all percentage-based, everyone pays their share, however poor you are. Or however wealthy you are. It's not the same amounts, same percentages. That's why God was so encouraged, or Jesus was so encouraged with a widow's might. That was total. The others were just bringing a token out of their offerings. More money, but less. Because it wasn't the first fruit in it. Surplus. Praise God for people who give surplus. I'm all for that. But if you want to get us to it where you've got a surplus... You need his economy working in your life. And it starts in the wonderful principle of first fruits. That's the way it works. So what happened to us? We started down that path. Then not everyone in our ministry does it, of course, because there's no law or legalisms or 
bondage, but we teach it and encourage people too. And I can look in this and say now, with all the spiritual sons I work with, because we build from the, the foundation of fathers and sons, in the spiritual sons, male and female, that I work with individually in my life, I don't know one of them that is, lives by the, the principles that's not blessed and prosperous today, not one. I know those who dodge it a little bit struggle as well. But put it this way, I don't know anyone who's doing it who's not, right, that I know of. But I'm not also not saying this. I know people who are blessed and got plenty of money and everything that don't live that way. Because there's more to it than just math. There's character, there's heart, there's reason, there's purpose, there's your love for God, love for his king and the kingdom. And Do you know what I mean? It's, a, it's not just a good luck charm, but it's a foundational stone that you can begin to work into your life. And if you will... If you're already a tithing person, it's not difficult to include first fruits into it as well. Not difficult at all. Most can easily do that if you already set your financial base in that kind of way. But if you're struggling to even get a financial base in your life at all, maybe tithing's a scary thing to you, maybe you could never you know, just even do it, get started somewhere. If you're not a giver, Get some systematic giving, and the best place to start is in the first fruit area. Now, I'm not saying anyone here, first fruit and don't tithe, because God wants us to first fruit. His financial equation is simply this. We run a little computer thing, so I put all my income through it. It prints out exactly where I'm at with my first fruit giving, where I am in my first tithe giving, my second tithe giving, and my third tithe giving. We live legalistically by it. The computer makes me. No, we don't live legalistically. You know, there's a difference between living accurately and legally. See, legalism is a position of heart. Accuracy is a desire to honor a God. See, you can be accurate without being legal. But we feed it through. Why? Because I know because I teach on it. The Bible says you teach on something, you can be judged twice as hard kind of thing. But also at the same time, I realize that I want to live this way. My wife describes it as our first fruits. It's almost like walking around with a blessing first. Because you can't touch it. Because the one thing the Bible makes very clear about first fruits is this. Only the, you, you bring it to the high priest. I'll, I'll explain what that means. But to a person in your life or someone who's like a dad, spiritual dad, ap apostolic, prophetic life, in wherever you bring it. But it says they, uh, they have... Only they can eat it. You can't eat it. In fact, it says in the Didache, which was the, the writings of the apostles that didn't make the scriptures, so we're not making doctrine of it, but how they would assimilate people into house churches in the early days in the, in the New Testament church, that they would say this, if there's no one that comes through that you lift your first fruits to, then whatever you do, don't eat it. Give it to the poor. But whatever you do, don't eat it. That was the power that was in it because it could destroy you. Not in a legally wrong way again, but just a bit like the door, you know, and the enemy at the door waiting for you. You've got to get it out of you. More than any other part of giving, it's got to get out of you. And so you have this wonderful joy of first fruits. I, I could tell you one of the first things when we got into understanding it, Mara and I just looked, we, we, we backtracked our giving for a little bit and worked out our first fruit giving over a period and, and said to the Lord, we've got this amount of money, okay, first fruits, w w which spiritual fathers does it go to? And we felt the Lord just told us a few spiritual fathers in our life that we were no longer walking with, we needed to start there by just writing them a letter, thanking them for the input into our life and sending them the gift. And I got a letter back straight away from one uh, it was quite a substantial gift we sent this person uh, reasonably not huge but reasonably substantial from in our position so we, we sent it and they said we were sitting at our desk my wife's f father in another nation was very very ill and we're thinking dear god how do we get the air ticket to send her and as we prayed that prayer within days your first fruit offering arrived i tell you a wonderful testimony 
Just last week, we celebrated 40 years of when Marin and I went for a two-week mission to Wales. We were living in England, and we went to Wales to do a two-week outreach, and we ended up staying two years. And out of there, a little revival broke open in a girls' school. And out of there, um, what became our Church of the Nations family started. So we just celebrated 40 years just week. And two of the girls who got saved, the first two really that got saved in the school were at the conference with us just two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And they were leaders in our work and that down there now. But one of them came up at the end and just gave Marilyn a card because they live out of their church life there and all of that that goes on. Brought a card and she was the first one that actually really got saved, that really got involved with God. She just wrote a card, wrote a message to Marilyn and I in it and then there was this amount of money. And as we read it, it brings tears to my eyes to think about it. She just simply wrote this. This is a first fruit from your first fruit. This is a first fruit from your first fruit. Forty years on. Amen? I want to tell you, this stuff works. And you can work it in the right way. The principles of it. Because God's a principle God. God doesn't run. God will do miracles for you, but he doesn't run the world by miracles. He runs it by principles. Amen? You encouraged? Getting something out of it? Enough to ask me some questions tomorrow night? Come back with some to ask. But I just want to say this to you. When you understand the principles, Christian life goes to another level. See, I always say there's only three questions any Christian need to ask himself. One is, whose am I? Two, who am I? And three, to whom am I joined to walk it out? So one is, do I know I'm a son of the Father? Do I know Father's love in my heart? Am I secure in his fatherhood? Am I always battling to get there? Or am I really walking sonship out? Secondly, from that, do I know who I am? I'm not trying to be someone else. I'm comfortable with my own skin. I know who God's made me to be or I'm on the way of discovery of it. It's wonderful. And thirdly, to whom am I joined? Where am I spiritually aligned? Who are my spiritual dads? Where am I apostolically aligned? Am I locked into the family of God's people? Am I really relationally tied? If you can answer those three questions, Christianity goes into a whole different realm. You're not spending your life trying to prove yourself to anyone. You're not living with insecurities and fears of failure. You're not trying to become someone you're not. And God's principles economically can slip into gear. You'll end up being a blessing. Tremendous blessing. God will just lead you. It's wonderful how God just unpackages it. Takes us down the journey of it. Always a temptation to do a six-hour seminar when you get into something like this. But, but I do want to encourage you because also included in it is some of the keys to supernatural cancellation of death as well. And some of you could do with it. God to intervene. And, but God will still do miracles. Don't get me wrong. He does miracles. But God can step in into your life in ways like you've never dreamt possible. I've lived it myself. Mara and I have lived it. We decided, and this is not to put condemnation on anyone else, because Father had some idea what he was leading us into and what we were going to leave. But when we got married, we made the decision we'd live a death-free life. And I'm glad that we did, because we moved the family to live on three continents. And, you know, it's not always easy. But it's start somewhere and it started in his fatherhood with us it started with us understanding what it was like what it's like to sow and give you know, but position oneself to where God I want to be a part of a different economy that can provoke the world to jealousy the Bible says we're even going to provoke the Jews to jealousy and I tell you you're not going to provoke Jews to jealousy if there's not economics in it. I mean, good night when Jews didn't, when the Jewish people never even had a nation. 
unbelievable. Only 4% of America's population was Jewish. They never even had their own nation. 4% of America's population was Jewish, and they controlled 40% of the wealth of the nation. Why? Because they knew the principles. That's why the rabbi could say to my friend in Germany, this is God's economy. It's the way it works. Even when we're not believing in Jesus and all of that, the principles still work. It's the way he runs it. Doesn't matter. You don't have to believe Jesus. You don't even have to believe Jesus loves you. You don't even have to believe Jesus came here and died to open your mouth, breathe, and get air free. That's why people will live by principles. That's why businesses begin to teach. No, you've got to set more money aside. For yourself, for others. Even the business world is starting to look to know how these principles work. How much more should we in the body of Christ because we get the Father's blessing upon them, his grace upon them as well. Amen? So I'm going to pray for you and believe with you tonight.